If you're looking for something, if you want to get out of town for spring break, you can do that. Okay, everyone, could you all please take your seats and find out? Um, you want me to ask for it? Yeah, so that's how we can do it. I'll see if I can get a point. I don't have it. Uh, today, I am pleased to welcome Nick Ross, who leads the data science and back end engineering efforts at the Meta. That's got nothing to do with Facebook, I assume. Nothing to do with Facebook. I hope those are uh, copyright and trademark <laughs> proceedings are flying. Not allowed to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> He's also no stranger to USF, having worked as a professor of data science in the MSDS program. His talk today is titled A-B Testing Incorrectly. Um, we'll be answering some of your questions during the presentation. I want to leave some time at the end of the presentation to answer questions. If you have a question during the presentation, please raise your hand and I'll pass these microphones. Um, if you're attending online and you have a question, please enter it in the Q&A button and uh, we will, I will ask the question. Um, so welcome, Nick. You hear me? Is this coming from the microphones? Yes. Good. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be back. It's great to be back, especially in person. It's a nice, nice seeing people sitting next face to face. Um, we are, my company is not in person yet and uh, probably will never be as we're remote. But um, yeah, it's really great to be back. So uh, what am I going to talk about today? Uh, I always think it's important to lay out the logistics. I will give an introduction. I'll talk about myself because I know the most about myself. So I like to start on a high note. I'll then start talking about A-B testing, which I know a little bit less about. And then I will, at the end, take questions from you where I know nothing about those. So about me, academically, uh, I got my PhD from UCLA in management in 2012. I have a master's in econ from UC Davis before then, and I am a full-fledged product of the UCs as I did my undergraduate at UC Berkeley in math. About me professionally, and this is where I get my A-B testing experience. Um, I started after my after I graduated from undergrad. I spent about four years as a senior consultant at Bates White, where I did what was what would be called data science today. Uh, specifically, I worked on uh, a host of uh, statistical and epidemiological models, trying to model mitigation outcomes. Then went and got my degree, and then I ended up at a company called Tinyco, which is a video game company. Spent about two and a half years there. I then spent about two years at a more well-known video game company called Sega. And then uh, I spent six years here. And now for the last year and a half, I have led the backend engineering and data science efforts at the Meta. So here's some video game titles I've worked on. This is the most exciting slide I have. Some of them you may recognize, some of them you may not. Um, the the, uh, so those, they were mainly for mobile and a little bit for PC. So currently at the Meta, uh, I want to talk a little bit about it because I think it's a fun company. We are an eSports digital training platform. Has anybody, anyone play uh, first-person shooters? Yeah, a whole bunch of people. We make a software that will make you better at first-person shooters. It is like a gym for eSports and a lot, very, a, a host a large number of professional esports players use our title. And oh no, trust this, of course. 
Let me give you an example, because I think it'll be fun, of what we do. Oh, no. This is one of our training scenarios. This is the world record. Let's see what happens. Will this work? <laughs> this is the person training in our software. <laughs> <laughs> so just in case you were thinking about going professional playing esports, just remember this. This is what you have to be able to do to be a professional esports player. So what am I going to talk about today? I am going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about a few issues that often aren't covered in A-B testing, uh, traditional A-B testing academic classes, um, specifically as someone who's built and designed testing experimentation platforms for a couple of companies now, I have a little bit of insight into common failure modes that exist in these platforms. And uh, hopefully that'll give you a little bit of insight when you start taking, as you are either studying A-B testing or you are going to be studying A-B testing. So let's start with what's an A-B test. An A-B test is a control, I'll do a little bit of a high level. For the people who know what A-B testing is, this will be boring. For everybody else, it'll be a very quick run through. What is A-B test? An A-B test is a controlled experiment. It's the way that we can determine whether some metric is determined, causally determined by something else. Uh, we, the way that we do this is we define a number of different factors or what we call experimental conditions. So you can picture this as buttons on a website or colors on a web page. And we have these different levels or factors. And then what we do is we assign units, which in the case of online experiments tend to be users, into each of these buckets. We then, because we are randomly placing the units into each bucket, we can rely on what's called the randomization principle to, con to conclude at the end of the day that changes in our metric of interest that are different between these two different populations are caused by the underlying change, the size of the button or the color of the web page. So to give a more concrete example, oh no, what I do this time? Cool. Okay. So to give some more concrete examples, you can imagine this situation. We have two different add to cart layouts, uh, one on the left, one on the right. And what we do is we assign a whole bunch of people to each of them. We then measure the likelihood of making a purchase in each of them. And then we conclude, we pick a winner based on that metric of interest. So in this case, we have a whole bunch of people who see the called the vertical scrolling add to cart versus the horizontal button add to cart. 5% of people make purchases on one side, and we would conclude that the group A or the vertical scrolling uh, add to cart is a better way to entice people to make purchases. We pick the winner, um, and then we go on and we run another A-B test somewhere else. And in the course of this, we can optimize correctly. So here's a whole bunch of fun examples. Uh, this is, I believe, was this Apple TV no, or Netflix? I can't remember which. So Netflix, right? These were three different things that I that uh, one of the people that I work with experienced and took screenshots of. The try it now button is actually just different on each of them. This is another one. This is Google Shopping. This was just me refreshing my web page. You can see it's the exact same search. Sometimes it comes with the vertical scroll. Sometimes it comes with this. More than likely, it's maybe test. Another one here's on Etsy. How do we do searches on Etsy? Well, there's that one. All three of these alternatives can appear on it, have appeared on Etsy. So who does A-B testing? Now we know a little bit about what it does. Who does it? Basically everybody. Large organizations, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft are running up to 10,000 experiments per year. I went to a talk at Twitter a few years back and they said concurrently that they usually run between hundreds and thousands of experiments on a daily basis. LinkedIn has reported that they're running 400 experiments per day, and uh, thousands of companies use tools such as Optimizely, Kissmetrics, Mixpanel, Google Analytics, a whole bunch of other ones, all of which uh, basically help you set up A-B tests on your website. Facebook, Netflix, eBay, Microsoft, Twitter, you don't even remember what this one is. 
GSN, all of these job descriptions are job descriptions that include at a high level or include at a very significant level, A-B testing or experimentation. Everybody does this. Where do they do it? They use it, as you can imagine, all over the place. Um, interesting examples of this that I've seen, a couple of years back, a seminar speaker in the seminar gave a talk about how they do experimentation on the Netflix algorithm. So how do we, what do we, you know, the main Netflix bar, what, what they're going to recommend next. That's a really interesting problem. And um, they talked a lot about the issues that arise from it. They have a whole design data science team that just does experimentation around that first recommendation thing, that first recommendation piece. Why? Because money. If you are using the, a control experiment is the only cleanly way to determine whether the underlying change that you make to a particular product is what's driving you know, a, a particular uh, outcome metric of interest that you're interested in. And if you do a bunch of A-B testing and your competitor's not doing A-B testing, you'll probably end up with a better product from these KPI perspectives. So why do you do it? Because you want to remain competitive. Uh, it allows you to listen to your customers in a way that can overcome some biases that organizations have. Examples of the biases like my gut, the designers, or the hippo. Who here, knows, who here has heard this acronym before? The hippo? Anybody? We'll just call it a generational thing, and I'm old. This is the highest paid person in the room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or highest paid person in the office, I believe. It's not, it's not really. But yeah, the hippo is the, the person who makes a lot of decisions, and A-B testing allows you to break away from that type of decision. So how do we do an A-B test? How do we run an A-B test? We think about a metric that we wish to, to optimize for. So hypothetically speaking, we want to optimize for the likelihood that someone makes a purchase in our application. We translate our business hypothesis, we translate this business hypothesis into statistical hypotheses. So we usually have a control and a treatment, or we could have multiple treatments. And each one of these would correspond to one of those underlying variants. In this case, we could have our current web page, and then we could have a treatment, which is having a bigger button bigger buy now button or redder buy now button. And we run a couple, we basically translate our business hypothesis to this uh, more rigorous statistical hypotheses. We then define our experimental conditions, big button, little button. We then determine how many experimental units, AKA users, we wanna put in each bucket. And we determine this by doing significance and power analysis, which are dealing with the type one and type two error. For those people in the MSDS program, you guys have talked about types of errors, right? Good, excellent. So we basically run a bunch of uh, equations that allow us to say, you need 10,000 people in each bucket to feel comfortable with the results. I'm not gonna put the, um, the, the, uh, the actual formulas because the formulas change depending on our features. We then collect our data. We estimate our metric of interest for our data. So we run our experiment. There's 10,000 people in each bucket, hypothetically. We go, we look what percentage of people pay. Is it 5%, 2%, 3%? We then compare them, and then we run a Z-test usually on them. There are other more complicated situations, but essentially we just run a Z-test in 90% you know, of the time. Uh, so that's the basics of A-B tests. There are also much more complex ones. So the guys at Netflix and LinkedIn Research and all those guys, they're doing much, much more complex Words that you will hear that I will not talk about are things like factorial designs, fractional factorial designs, response surface designs, multi-arm bandits. All of these are more advanced techniques that allow you to achieve other goals while you're doing your A-B testing. In the case of the first three, those three things are designed to allow you to minimize the number of experiments that you have to run when you have lots of different variations. While a multi-arm bandit usually is designed to minimize the number of people you have to put in each bucket to be able to conclude whether your result is statistically significant, as well as not lose by putting people in a bucket that's losing. So there's tons of resources. Uh, and so you'd give it, so, you know, oftentimes I'll see something, uh, you know, I look at this, I go, oh, this must be a solved problem. There's all these books. Uh, but it turns out that it's actually really hard. 
And the, the real reason it's just, is hard is because industry problems, at least from my perspective, tend not to be the same as do not necessarily align 100% with academic, uh, academic interests. There's a whole bunch of reasons for this. Um, industry problems are usually not publishable. If someone came to me and said, Nick, I will, if some super awesome professor came to me and said, Nick, I will help you run your A-B tests, I'd be like, great. And if he said, but I need to publish the results afterwards, I would say, no, because I wouldn't want my competitors to have it. Industry problems may also be too specific. The problems that we face in industry tend to be a function of our organization and our technology choices that have gotten us here and our product choices. They are not usually the things you want to talk about. And oftentimes they're just really, really, really hard and they're not solvable in a nice way that you could publish in a paper. We oftentimes make a host of very terrible assumptions that are not defensible in an academic context. This paper just talks a lot about that. So if you look at the, I like the, I like reading the, the author list of this paper and they did a, what they called the, they had a conference for challenges that online controlled experiments, AKA AB testers faced. And you can see that all these people got together and these are all very, very smart people at very, very rich companies. And they said, hey, here are the problems we're facing. And they wrote this in a couple, a couple of years ago. And this is a list of unsolved problems in uh, AB testing. It's a really good paper, highly recommend uh, going through it. And I'm gonna talk about four of the issues that are in there very quickly. Okay, so issue number one, failing to define a user. So I've talked about, we put 10,000 users in each bucket. What is a user? Uh, that seems really simple. Like you are a user, you are a user, you are a user. It's not, it's really, really, really hard. How many people have gone to a website without logging in? How many people have then gone to that website and logged in? Are you two users or one user? Some of you are writing up, putting up two, some of you are putting up one. That's very confusing for AB testing. You can only either be two users or one user. You cannot be both at the same time. This is not like Schrodinger's users. Um, so we use these identification strategies. We basically, at the end of the day, we have to decide what a user is based on an identification strategy. We go, is this person the same or is this person different? And the, the three most common ones are the ones you see up here, software-based software -based identification, things like web cookies, file on a hard drive, Hardware-based identification, this has gone out, but used to be a lot more common. Serial numbers, phone numbers, that kind of thing. And then required logins like Facebook, Twitter, or a lot of companies roll their own logins. All of these come with significant downsides. None of them will allow you to precisely define a user the way that you would mentally define what a user is. Even within those three, though, you have this other thing, which is most companies kind of do a mix of them. So um, I'm sure that the most common login flow that I see on the web, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is one that basically lets you kind of start using the product, but you hit a wall about like, you know, five or 10 minutes in, you hit a wall, pops up and says, hey, to do anything else, you have to create a login. That makes it really complicated because a person could conceivably do that first little third 20 times before they decide to actually log in. Um, Logins could be optional, but given different features, uh, different accounts that may or may not be linkable. Uh, so I'll give you an example. At the Meta, we distribute our application via Steam, which is a way that game companies distribute their applications. Every user to get our application has to have a Steam ID, but when they log into our application, they create a Meta ID. For most users, this is the same, but for some users, they like to play on two different computers or they like to have two different Steam IDs because they have one that's like their practice uh, account and one that there's like their professional account. And because of that, we have this weird mismatch of multiple Steam IDs and multiple users that can have an effect on how we, do, how we define a user. Uh, Quora, uh, I, I have a whole bunch of answers on Quora. And when I logged in one time, I used my email. And when I logged in another, I Facebook connected. And um, I can't connect those two accounts. Just can't do it. I sent them an email and they said it's impossible. So I am two users on Quora, despite the fact that I am one human being. So why does this matter? A user may experience multiple experimental treatments. 
Uh, so let's say Nick has no login, assigned to treatment group A, then I create an account, I'm assigned to treatment group B. That means I've potentially have experienced both A and B. That's bad for like a statistical methodology perspective. I use my Twitter login on desktop, my Facebook, log my Facebook login on mobile, my accounts aren't linked, one is in group A, one is in group B, or I sign up to receive a newsletter with two different email addresses, and I look for the best deal in any A-B test situation. This is actually incredibly common. People who run um, uh, like lots of like big email newsletters will know this problem. Um, so like, to just to be clear, this is the case where somebody signs up with many, many email addresses uh, to the same like coupon service because they're just looking for more coupons. And you get it, it happens all the time. A uh, quick trick around that is if you add a plus to your email, so like, Nick plus a at gmail.com. This just goes to Nick at Gmail. Those are the same email addresses. But this one will more than likely, by most naive services, be picked up as a second user. I've gone to companies where databases that are just filled with these. Same user trying to like get in different groups. So the result of this, for many knife edge conclusions, like when you're designing your A-B test, one of the things you wanna design for is have the minimum number of users in each bucket so you can run the test for the shortest amount of time so you can get your result as quickly as possible. What that means is that you're oftentimes standing on a knife edge. You're like, if the number of users that you've estimated is incorrect, that can sway your test from one direction to the other. This type of systematic identification can destroy your test results um, in a way that is pretty negative. So how do we solve this? Uh, so there's a couple of different ways of solving it. Solving it, number one, or at least the way that I have found to solve it, is well-defined tests. So you try to create testing situations that don't that are in a part of your application or part of your product that doesn't allow the user definition problem to be as persuasive. So maybe you test only users who have already created a login, and therefore you've gone past that. Or you only test the login flow up until someone creates an account. And in this case, you'll kind of move it to a more <clears throat> comparable situation. Rely on organizational momentum. This is a big one. When you define a framework, you try to define a framework for testing within your organization, which avoids these issues. Uh, once you, you know, from my own experience, once you have an organizational momentum, like this is the way we test, this is what's testable, this is what's not testable, everybody tends to follow it and you can continue on that path. Not exciting, it's not an exciting answer, but it is the way that you can that you can help mitigate these types of user problems. Any questions on that before jumping to the next one? No? Great. All right. Peaking. This is my favorite one. Uh, this is my favorite second. Well, this is this is a good one. Peaking is a phenomenon whereby your product manager that you're working with on your data science team goes to the A-B test dashboard every day, hits refresh, and says, why aren't we stopping the test now? You guys are laughing at that, but that's really what happens, is that you provide users with information about a test, and you say, hey, we need 10,000 people in each bucket. And after the first day, there's 150 people in each bucket, and the conversion rates look like that. And some guy goes, wait, this conversion rate is double. We should just switch this. Why are we not switching this? Obviously, 10% is bigger than 5%, you dumb data scientist. Where did you go to school where they do math in the opposite direction? Treatments clearly better than control. Um, and you have to say, hey, no, we haven't, these tests are not statistically significant. Um, the problem and the reason that this is hard so in this example, let's say that we set up an experiment, we need a thousand users in the treatment and control. On the first day, you look, you see something like this. Um, and the, the, pro the trouble and the reason that this happens is, or sorry, the, the reason this is bad is when you stop the experiment early, all of your significance and power calculations you did before are no longer valid. So you said, hey, we want a 5% significance level with an 80% power on our test. And now that's not true anymore. You cut it early. So this happens because every one of these services has these really cool, awesome dashboards that they sell all the product managers. 
you, know, you can go in and you can look at all of these beautiful dashboards and just pick and choose A's and B's all over the place. Pick winners left and right, and you'll be able to optimize everything. These dashboards are the death of data scientists because the number of times that a data scientist will go into this dashboard and realize that someone has clicked the button to stop the test, even though it's not statistically significant, is just off the charts. So why is this a problem? It's hard to run these tests at the end. Uh, when you stop the tests early, you will run into situations where um, it is, it's not statistically significant. Okay. Just to give you, I'm going to kind of skip a couple of those because I am talking, uh, I'm running a little bit late. Uh, well, this is a, a hypothetical situation. So what we've done here is we are running a test with a thousand users and we are peaking after basically the number of peaks. So if you peak just once, so you're running your test and you go after the first user comes in, you peak at the results and you decide, should I, should I conclude the test or not? If you do that, the more that you peak, the more that you will likely conclude that your test in the wrong direction. Okay. So if you have, so in this case, we have two groups of a thousand people in each bucket. Uh, if you peak twice, the likelihood that you, your type one error rate will go from 0 0.05, which we assume is the background significance you wanted, your significance will go from 0 0.05 to say 0 0.07. If you peak a hundred times, your significance is probably at point eight. It's not a good, not a good look. Don't peak. So how do we solve this problem? How do we do this? Well, mathematically, we can use this crazy thing called sequential testing. It's really hard. It's really uh, a lot of math. Um, what I found to be a better solution of after sequential testing is to just be really loud in the UI. Make it so that the product manager looks at this and goes. This is red, I shouldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Question in the back. Yeah, so I'm a little bit confused about how just the act of peaking can- It's peaking and canceling, sorry. If you okay. peak and then cancel based on if the results are just is significantly okay. different, yeah. Question. Yeah, um, how do you determine kind of your population size? Is it just like your user base or like when you get bigger companies, it seems like to be like almost infinite, like how many people have access to the internet? No, so there's there's two there's two different things, which is there's the so the question was how do we determine the population size? So there's two there's a couple different things. There's like the user base. This thing's cutting in and out. I apologize. There's hello, 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 hello. It's not working. Yeah, really push it right against the thing. Otherwise, just go like this. Nope. See, it's just all right. I'll switch it. The battery die. Could be. Yeah. Hello. All right, this one works. So the question was, how do you determine your population size? For these types of calculations, you're not looking at the population size. You're looking at the sample size calculations. The population doesn't really matter for these types of calculations. Uh, so my question is, like, how do you send a different? You have, to, you have to send a user to a different URL, right? For like the, the different button size. So the question is, is how do you actually do this? And there's a lot of different ways of doing the act running the test on a website you could send them to possibly two different urls what's much more common is that the back-end server that you're running will just send you know in the simplest way of thinking essentially sending two different http sorry html docs so i look at the request coming in and i go you're in group a because you logged in as your name and group a gets this html and group b gets that html that's like a a simplification but that's the general way that these things are done yeah, uh, follow up question. So how do how do we determine or decide the sample size? So that so the the, the uh, equations for determining that are incredibly specific to the type of test and a lot of other assumptions. And when you take your and I'm not gonna they're just beyond the scope of this class. You can look online for different formulas for depending on the situation. Cool. All right. So. The solution to making try not to peak is you have to be very, very, you have to be very strong, have a very strong personality uh, and stop the product managers from doing this. And the best way that I've seen to do this is to be uh, basically make it so it's obvious that it's a mistake to stop early. All right, failing to lift off. 
This is a really fun one. So let's say that you are the you are the data scientist and you've been running A/B tests. And every day you go to your product manager and you're looking at this dashboard. You ran your first test. The control had 17% people pay. The treatment had 12% people pay. It's statistically significant, statistically valid. You go, obviously, we're going to do the control group, right? It's way higher than the treatment. 17% of people, let's say, are paying versus 12. You want to do that. The estimated difference is 5%. You make the change, but you actually only see a difference of 2%. Next week, you run a test. 5% in control, 2% in treatment. Your estimated difference is three, but it turns out that after you do it, it's only 1.8. Test number three, 7% control, 3%. Your estimated difference is four, but you look at the data after you implement, and it's only 3.2. Test number four, control is 9%, treatment's 4.5. You implement the difference, you implement the test, and it turns out that you're only getting 4% in the actual difference. Same with test numbers. In every one of these examples, what you have is you have that the estimated lift that you would expect is less than the actual lift that you got. Every test, all the time. If you were the data scientist on this, how would you feel? Obviously, you'd feel bad about your job because you're likely to be fired. You're going to be like, oh, man, I've been telling my product manager every day that it's going to go up 5% and it's like going up 2%. It looks stupid. Um, so you are going to be feeling very, very sad. This happens because of the way that we estimate lift. In this case, this by this estimated difference, where you just take the difference between the treat, treatment and control, is a biased estimate of our lift. It's actually an overestimate. So if you run an A-B test and you just subtract A versus B, that is the maximum difference between the two. It is not the unbiased estimate of what between the two are. So, the reason that this happens is because we are only calculating these lifts conditionally, conditional on the test actually being statistically significant. So what we are doing is that rather than calculating the expected difference between control and treatment, we that difference that, that I calculate on the other page is the expected value conditional on that result being significant. And because that little bit of conditional difference exists, it means that every one of our estimated lifts are going to be biased up. In a very simple case, you can actually calculate what that bias is. In this case, you can see that, um, in this case, I just kind of worked it out in the case of a very simple normal, you know, the beautiful example that you always do in statistics three where everything's normal and unit variance and that kind of stuff. And you can see that the uh, if the unbiased if the, uh, the the estimated conditional value is actually going to be the actual difference plus this extra term where that term is the bias. So this is really interesting, and it can be an incredibly big problem, especially if the differences are really small, which is where. The, which is where you oftentimes are making these decisions. So if you're in a place where you're like, okay, our payer rate in group A is 1.1% and our payer group in group B is 1.12%. That 0 0.02 is an overestimate of the difference. And on top of it, because those things are so close together, it's probably a really big overestimate of the difference. And let's just say that the cost of actually implementing B is $100,000. Well, now you're in a situation where you said it's going to bump up everything by 0.02%. It's going to cost us $100,000. And suddenly we're actually going to lose money on the change because it wasn't actually 0 0.02. It's actually much smaller. So what can we do? Um, if you have a, uh, the way that I've dealt with this is I try to add the presentation layer a max difference or estimated lift so people don't think that's the actual value that they're going to receive. Um, but the really kind of sad part about it is that unless you have a lot of experiments run and you can basically do a money, like do a numerical calculation, these biases are really hard to compute. And so you can't really undo the bias in the presentation layer easily. All right, failing to design. All right, before I do this one, uh, questions. 
do you ever sorry do you ever uh reach a point in your experiment where it's where it's far enough along i just repeat do you ever reach a point in your experiment where the difference is large enough and it's far enough along that early termination is like warranted uh yes you can and like when you design the test there are things called sequential uh testing methods that are designed to just do that the problem is, is when you designed your experiment on the assumption that you will be all the way to the end before making that. Now, just to be clear, there's plenty of reasons to cut a test early. So uh, let's say that you're running your test and you've been running it for three days and it turns out that there are zero payers in one group. That probably means that maybe there's something technologically going on, like maybe the group B website is broken in some way where people can't make a purchase. So you cut the test to go back and reevaluate. I've done that a ton of times where it turns out one of our variants just doesn't work. Uh, there's something, there's some, some technological problem behind the scenes, which is preventing the expected behavior. So yeah, I've, I've done that. I have very, very, very infrequently, I mean, as a, that's kind of an edge case. And outside of using the sequential methods, I strongly recommend running a test to the end. So do we provide a, a confidence interval for lift that we are proposing to the product managers that could inherit the bias that we create in overestimation. As I was saying, you can do things like that, assuming that you have enough of, assuming that you have enough information on the shape of the whatever statistic that you're looking at. So you have to use numerical methods to be able to do that. There's no like, this isn't like the case where you can just like look up in a Z table and take like 1.12 and multiply it times everything and make it work. This is you have to do some additional stuff. And unless you have a lot of information, it's really hard to be able to calculate those types of things. Uh, we have one question from online. Uh, is there a way to find an unbiased estimate? Only in the simplest of, only very, very, very simple cases. Okay. I just have one question. Uh, when you talk about control group and the treatment, is the control group going to be the status quo as it is now? And how? How complex can the changes be to the treatment? Are they one feature, or is there kind of good practice as to what you include in the treatment? So, like the, the rule of thumb is you only test one thing at a time. However, the one thing can be really big. So, um, one thing that when I was working on uh, the video game Tiny Monsters, we AB tested the entire first time user flow, which is like the first five minutes of the game. For casino games, anyone ever play like online poker or online slots? Or like mobile game slots, people aren't raising their hand because they're just embarrassed to say that they have it. <laughs> For those games, they tend to A/B test the first 100 to 200 plays, so they will design the entire first 100 100 poker hands are all on rails, and they're testing it to see how people respond to try to increase the retention. So the most common thing in those types of games is is one of, the most, one of the things you try to optimize for is uh, places where the unexpected happens in a positive way. So you slowly lose, slowly lose, slowly lose, slowly lose, and on your last dollar, suddenly you win big. Like that'll keep you in a game. So they will, so oftentimes for this, you will try to A-B test your wins and losses in the first like 100 hands or 100 coins to figure out where to put those levels or where to put those experiences. From like an organizational standpoint, like, is it like a UFTI designer who's like deciding like what they want to test, like like the like button sizes for example? It depends on the company, just 100% depends on the company. Most of the time, like when I talk about this hypothetical magical data science org, I always blame it on the product manager, but most of the time it's it's a conglomerate of many, many people that you can blame. Sometimes UI UX, sometimes product managers, sometimes engineering people, it just depends. All right, so now we're going to talk about the hardest of hard problems, which is what's called interference. So interference occurs, one of the fundamental, let me take a step back, one of the fundamental assumptions that we make when we A-B test is that everybody is independent. Your decision doesn't affect your decision, doesn't affect your decision, and down the road. That is almost never the case. Everybody talks to everybody else. Everybody, like, you know, everybody is just... Everybody in any type of complex product, you are doing things that are going to affect the people around you. 
And when that happens, you break what's called the stable unit treatment value assumption. And when that breaks, all the math breaks, everything breaks. Um, and this is a very big problem for any type of application that leans heavily into social elements. So we'll talk about this. It's called a couple of different things. Some people call it interference. Some people call it contamination. I tend to call it network interference. Uh, and the notion of network interference is that your treatment units, your users, are affecting each other. But it can arise in a bunch of different ways. We're just going to focus for the purpose of this conversation on like social situations where, uh, where it's pretty easy to describe how this happens. Okay, so network interference. What if my experiment affects other users and in turn modifies their behavior? So if Facebook does an A-B test on people you may know. Let's say that, uh, let's just they do this and the control group sees as is. So this is the status quo people you may know. A treatment sees some kind of new flow. Well, if the treatment causes more friend requests, those more friend requests are going to spread throughout the network and they're going to hit people in both the treatment and the control. So even someone who is in the control is going to be affected by the new user flow from the people in the original treatment. It means that when we then do a comparison between the uh, expected lift between the treatment and the control, it's gonna be wrong because it isn't treatment and control. It's between people who 100% of the time were affected versus people who were touched a little bit by the experiment. This get, makes it really, really hard to do experimentation. These types of social networky things are just incredibly difficult. Uh, academically, how do we solve these? We, uh, we make these incredibly large array of assumptions. Uh, we pull in network statisticians who build these giant sparse matrices. Uh, they do these incredibly detailed models with lots and lots of parameters. Uh, and they use like a team of like 12 people uh, and they're able to solve it in that way. That's not, that unfortunately is not what every small startup can do. That's only what LinkedIn, Microsoft, Netflix, Google, and those guys do. In the real world, we tend to do two things. We tend to either just ignore it, just be like, no, nah, it happens, who cares? Or we try to design around it by doing things like geofencing, where only certain people who will not, people who are isolated will experience one or the other. Uh, or we do but for analysis, where we try to do some light modeling on the side to be able to do it. Um, but this is really bad. No matter what you do, this is really, really bad. So how bad is this? Um, it depends. So I, I, like, I like little baby models. I like building little toy models. My background is in economics and we do this all the time. So let's talk about a very simple situation where we have between treatment interference. So that's, this is what this looks like. This is people in group A will affect people in group B. So this is the, this is the common situation we just said with Facebook, the people you may know from. The way we're gonna model it is we're gonna say that the covariance between our units is zero uh, most of the time, but it's equal to some correlation factor if, uh, if the people are in the two different groups, some small correlation factor. When we would do our traditional t-statistic, which I'm sure you all remember, looks something like that. And without interference, the variance of this is one. In our stupid little model where the people in group A can kind of just touch the people in group B a little bit, our variance goes from one to one minus lambda. That lambda term is the correlation. Correlation can be positive or negative. What that means is that our estimate of our T, if we just don't do anything, so if we just run this silly little test, we run our A-B test, ignore this, our T could be an over or an underestimate of the actual T that we should be using. And we won't know unless we know what this value is. That's a bummer. So if the correlation between the, you could imagine the situation where Facebook has the people you may know, what if the new people you may know is actually encouraging you to reach out to your enemies? Like reach out to people you don't like. That could be meaning that what's happening is that that is creating a negative correlation between group A and group B. 
people in group B are seeing people they don't like, reaching out and friending them. It could also be creating a positive one, in which case that lambda would be positive. We would never be able to see that from the data. We would only be able to calculate. Well, we, it's very difficult to see that from the data. We would only see or calculate our T statistic, and we wouldn't even know if our T is over or an underestimate of the actual T. So the one nice thing about this type of interference is that if you have interference between groups in this very simple model, then if you increase your sample size, things kind of get a little bit better. Because when you increase the sample size, the difference between the two groups will spread naturally, or basically the variance of the, of the difference will spread naturally, and it'll kind of work itself out. So if you have a little bit of between interference, you can probably get away with making your sample sizes much, much larger than you would expect, and you'll probably be okay. What happens if we have this, where people in group A all affect each other and people in group B all affect each other. So in this case, we have interference where it's not across the groups, but between the groups. We draw up a little model, we do this. And in this case, we actually have a worse situation where the variance of our estimate has an N in it, meaning that as we increase the number of people, our estimate of our t or the difference between our actual T and our bad T is gonna get further and further apart. Moral of the story, interference is bad. Um, questions before I go on and talk more about interference. I'll give some fun examples too, because I know you're all bored now. Yeah. Does stretch out the length of the experience help or only the sample size? Dep depends, on what the, uh, depends on what the metric of interest is and what the actual setup is. The problem with spreading it out time-wise is then pushes your decision further and further into the future. And once again, the hypothetical product manager hates that. They wanted the decision yesterday, not two months from now. If you have a question, please wait till I have these microphones. There are people online who will be able to hear it. Yeah, so I have a question about like A B testing and uh, seeing that there's like causation between two variables. Mm -hmm. So I'm just thinking that what if the problem is that um say you have you observe that when you change something about variable A1, right? That and then there's some corresponding change in variable B2. But then it turns out that the ground truth is that A1 is causally related to B1. And that has, and then separately A2 is causally related to B2. This is in terms of truth. So there's a lot of different, like you can grab, like to think about causality is hard. It's just really, really hard. And if you have variables that are mixing in other things. So let's say, here's a great example. Let's say that, um, we're experimenting, our experimental conditions are um, our uh, big red button to buy, small red button to buy. Now let's say that it turns out that big red button to buy, uh, young people love that and old people hate that. And it's the opposite over here. So when you're running your A-B test in a situation, what you're not, what, what you're essentially capturing is like there, there's this confounding variable that's affecting the causality. And that can happen a lot. Like, there's a lot of different ways it can happen, but something like this. The randomization principle essentially says that like within each of those groups, if it's the case that there's some other confounding variable, that's going to just make the variance higher on all of these on all of our measures, right? You know, like basically, like you have like this notion of like within some like the within error sum of, within group sum of squares, the total sum of squares, and things like that. All of these are calculated based on that. The more confounding variables you put in there the more the sum of squares is going to get bigger and it's kind of going to trickle through the formula. Does that kind of answer your question? Probably not at all, but you uh, come to the answer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi, yeah, so um, what kind of like strata are like, are you ever stratifying samples or like doing like blocking or anything like that? Just yeah. Variables. Yep. But this can still happen within that. Like you can, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, Geofencing is, in a sense, some a version of that. So let me tell my favorite uh, example of this. So I worked on a game called Tiny Zoo, and Tiny Zoo was there was this hardcore group of players that uh, all talked to each other on Facebook. They had this Facebook group that was incredibly active. 
what we had realized was that when we put any of any of those people in an A-B test, they would like screenshot it and they get really angry because they would be like, why am I like, this is like the hardcore people. They don't want to be tested on. They don't feel like they're being experimented on. Uh, and they just get really, they would just be like a little bit irritated. So our solution was we found out, we basically looked and found out everyone who was in that group and we always just excluded them from the test to make sure that they were all in the same group. <laughs> Funny enough, it turns out that anger actually powers the entire world. And every time that this would happen, where there'd be like an A-B test where they'd get angry, all of them would buy whatever we were doing anyway. Oh, oh I, I just had a question from before. So it seems like, like a, a lot of extra analysis. And has there been, been comparison or is it very debased and if this is better than a completely naive approach? So if you were to completely A-B test naive, you know, not count for extraneous variables, and this works or this doesn't as it, is there a metrics to prove that's better or not better i mean you can i mean i can scribble on the board and show you that you the very easy situations where you'll just get the wrong like you'll you'll say like group a wins when it really is group b that wins yeah it's pretty it's not that hard to, to do the math and get that um so how to handle this type of interference as i said we use network modeling econometric all these are experiments. This is an example of, of the academic like network literature of how this is from a LinkedIn paper about how they handle interference. As you as you can see, this is not like import A B test from like SK Learn. Like this is obviously a step above that. It gets really, really hard, very, very difficult to do this correctly. So uh, moral of the story, I'm still like, I don't have a good answer for interference. I think it's really important. And if you do na naively just A B test. It's very easy to run into situations where bad things happen, where you end up getting the wrong result. Um, in general, my recommendation for this is try to avoid any type of test that has some type of social features, um, things like leaderboards, social offers, tie-in testing. Uh, these types of things are very, I think that uh, you should just make good decisions and until you're willing to invest in like heavy duty statisticians like a LinkedIn or Google or Facebook, you should just make your best guess. A-B testing them is not going to be ROI positive. Okay, conclusion. A lot of experimentation is well known. The details of implementation are incredibly difficult. There are a lot of solved problems that uh, affect the real world life of A-B people in industry. Uh, putting these solutions into practice is very, very difficult. So study them a lot and so you can get a good job. And I think that that's the end. Yeah, the end. <laughs> Is that the camera for Nick? Any questions? I'm asking questions. If you have questions, check on. Hi. So let's say you do an experiment and you find out that, okay, uh, your results are statistically significant and one treatment is better than the other and you implement that but how long is that valid and do you have to keep checking if the results are expired or so in this paper there's this thing called oh my gosh you're gonna forget uh no that, like there's um there's a there's a word they use for novelness that i can never remember um in this paper that i that i said one of the other things that they talk about is, is the fact that A-B testing is you're doing this test over a shorter time frame, but you're looking for long-term results. And there's obviously a mismatch there. There's definitely a novelness factor where if someone sees something new, they will click on it every time. Like that's how notifications work. So as you see one, you will, like your finger will just touch it. Um, and so that understanding, whether it's a short-term or long-term is very, very difficult. For a lot of like as for these heavy duty experimentation platforms, like companies are doing experimentation. They usually invest in like an all time control, basically someone who just always gets the status quo that they can try to peel back the layers around the problem of the long term results. The other thing, the other side of that is if you're running tons and tons of experiments, you run to the other issue, which is people are just a little confused at all points in time, and that's who you're optimizing over. Another question. Uh, it's related. Oh, thank so you. it's related to peaking. 
Okay. Uh, so beside, uh, I wanted to know about the positive. So uh, peaking. Besides that, your test is not going at all correct, then it can be stopped. What are other benefits of peaking? I think we have covered the negatives, but. Um, I think that, that, I mean, that's the biggest one, is the, is, that is the biggest one, to make sure nothing is going off the rails. Um, I think that there's always benefits of looking at your data and seeing fluctuations and things like that, just to make sure that, as I said, to make sure that nothing is going off the rails. But for peaking specifically, the action of, I'm going to go look at the test results early, really the only reason to do that is to protect that downside risk of something technologically bad happening or some other bad thing around that. But you would want to stop the test for a non-test reason. So uh, for like Target, for example, um, when Halloween comes around or when Christmas rolls around, they have certain sections there. Um, have you ever noticed anything or like, is there a way to tell from like A-B testing, um, like seasonality of like, you have a certain model and then as it cycles through you then, Start doing like different models? Like, is there a way to do that with A B testing? I mean, so this gets back to a little bit what, what the other gentleman was saying, which is that in when you are doing A B testing, you are doing almost inherently tests on short term behavior. So, even so, the part of the reason that these companies are doing thousands and thousands and thousands of tests is I suspect is that they're repeating a lot of older tests to see whether the results still hold because you just don't know. Um, you know, you can imagine like, if I A-B tested like the most popular, I don't know, Halloween costume in 1987, I'm clearly not going to keep putting that out there. Like there's only so many Ronald Reagan masks that people want to buy. That was a pretty good joke for those people over 40. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? Like there, there's just, there's limited value. Like figuring out what long-term value there is in these tests is a hard problem. And long term, of course, it includes things like seasonality. It includes things like just general change in your population dynamics. Like last year at Target, maybe the economics, the economy went down. So you had a different group of users that a different group of buyers than you do today, where the economy is behaving very differently. Uh, I'm, I'm here. So I have a question. Like, so uh, can you introduce that? Is there any case that is a misuse of baby tests or to extend is abuse of? A-B testing, for example, like uh, you can maybe uh, use some other easier method to solve the problem, but you like people just say, oh yeah, since we can do experiments, why, why don't you run experiments on that? Uh, so for those kinds of things. I mean, so I didn't talk about any of the ethical issues around A-B testing. That's obviously a very important, incredibly important consideration. So like I can come up with, um, I mean, I'm pretty sure like there's, there's historically many, many examples of people doing experiments on people that are nefarious in different ways and you can see that i mean and you can see that now like it's not a hard stretch to go from like if i i suspect that for many of the tests that people are running on some of these on some social platforms especially the social ones the the likelihood that you would be happy being in that test is is variable some of you would be fine with it some of you would be really really unhappy some of you would be incredibly angry and shocked and so there's there's the component of the ethics behind it which is like you, we could talk for days and days and days about that um that's definitely a bad that's definitely a place where the answer is like don't do experiments uh in terms of like statistical modeling when you're at a company that's doing experiments the limitation tends not to be what experiments to do you usually have like in every company that i've worked we had like a spreadsheet of like experiments we wanted to run. And the question is, how are we gonna prioritize them? Because we only have so many users. Like if we have an application that's 100,000 users, we do an A-B test, at most we'd put 50,000 people in each one a day. And if I have 100 experiments I wanna run, I can only run so many at a time. So the limitation, in, the limitation tends to be that experiments where you could get the result from a non-experimental Thing, you tend to jump on that because you just don't have the bandwidth to do it in an experimental way. So my question kind of follows up on that a little bit. Is there a theoretical limit to the severity of the change that you can test? Like, for example, is it best practice to just test like color and size of a button versus testing at the same time, running the same test for color and size? Yeah, so I mean, that gets into like the multi, the, the factorial and other types of experiments where you're when you are changing multiple dials at the same time. 
in the back of your mind when you're writing an A-B test, the, the more complex the differences are, the less, I, that's a good way of putting this, is you're only ever testing the whole. So if you do a very complex thing where you're changing nine things, it's not like you then at the end have the ability to pick and choose which ones were actually driving that change. This is better than that. It's not because of this button. It's not because of this frame. It's not because of this color. This totality is there. And so the more comp so it's a balancing act around the complexity of the change versus what information you can glean from it and what, it, and what kind of changes that you want to make to your product. It's entirely, like for example, let's just say you want a really complex test where you change so much of the screen. Afterwards, if you just go, oh, we're only going to change the button size, it's highly probable that you actually just made your product worse than the original control. Hello. Um, I have a question. I, I just think that all of the situation mainly is you're not wrong, like as that much as you want. But in that part, uh, once you apply it, apply the A-B test and you find that you, you suppose they increase, increase four, but actually it's three points separate. Yep. Um, is it possible to run in a risk that total flip over, like you're really hurting your products or like so far we are curious, uh, like cautious. Yeah, absolutely, now. absolutely. Like people run experiments have just murdered products. Like that happens all the time. It's another reason that they, another reason to kind of peak. It gets back to, it gets back to peaking. Um, uh, getting back to your example, uh, another thing that A-B testing has done for us is, is less testing and more rollout. And in those cases, you want to peak all the time. So there's something called a blue-green deployment, which is a very common way of doing this, where basically what you do is you, you, you're going to make a change to your product. And what you do is you, uh, from the technology side, you just kind of essentially A-B test that change before you roll it out to everybody. In those types of things, you're always peaking. Like your whole goal is to verify that the two groups are behaving exactly the same. But yeah, there's plenty of examples of people making changes to products that are just awful. And uh, the if you look up bad, if you look up bad like A/B test marketing, you will find plenty of bad A/B test marketing stuff. Is there, is there something like uh, for a large enough sample size? Is there something like a multi-layered A/B test? So a multi-layered A/B test. So yeah, like there's like layered. hierarchical models and things like that that you can do. The the response, like the multi, the factorial models, was the one that tend to factorial and like the fractional factorial. Those are the ones where you kind of break up the groups of like. Let's just say you want to test button size and size, button size and color of button. You would use those types of models to kind of be able to figure out what the interact inter the the effect is between all four. Uh, so, I mean, can you extend uh, a, a test, say, you know, you have test A, mm -hmm. and then uh, possibly just, you know, uh, test the same population for another, say, for section A of test A. I mean, uh, is it possible to test them further? As I mean, you can do whatever you want, but you just have to keep doing the math on it. Like, and that's where it gets hard. So, like, you just have to, like, if you if you want to change your test in the middle, now you're going back to like all of these like simple formulas that we have with like the t-test are relying on these very, very, very specific sets, sets of assumptions. And we, you know, like we stare at the law of large numbers and such a limit theorem, and we make we feel like, oh, it kind of works. The more that you kind of, the more that you play with them, the more that you degrade those assumptions, the more you might need an additional sample size, that kind of stuff. Uh, we have one question online. Um, how do you make sure that the control experiment is valid? Uh, do you use simulation, simulation results uh, from a preset model? How do I use what? Yeah. Uh, how do you make sure that the control experiment is valid? Oh, that's valid? Yes. Um, I, yeah, so like, when you're, I think the question is, how do you set up like an A, like how do you set up your platform to make sure that your platform actually works? And that's a really great question. So the most common way of doing that is what's called an AA test. Has anyone heard an AA test? So what an AA test is, is you basically give both sets of groups the exact same thing and you see what your software says. And if your software says that one group is doing different than the other one, there's something wrong with your software or there's something wrong with your methodology. 
It's really common uh, to run AA tests when you're developing a platform, when you're thinking through, uh, like, is my test software working, that kind of thing. And I think that that would be the most common way. If someone's like, is your A-B testing platform valid? I would run an AA test to see what the results were. So you showed earlier a lot of the companies and the requirements are like in the job description, they said A-B testing is, is uh, yeah. like required or, you know, um, preferred. So in your experience, I mean, you know a lot about A-B testing. Would you suggest us aspiring data scientists to be really, really good at A-B testing or start looking into other methodologies of testing like the ones you mentioned earlier? I mean, there's trade-offs around all of this. So I would say that if I was an aspiring data scientist, the number one thing I would do is get good at programming. That would be number one. Uh, once you have gotten there and you're thinking about the other things, like you have to, there's, there's long-term optimization and short-term optimization. Short-term optimization is what do I need to be able to get an interview and succeed in that first interview? In general, they're not going to jump into, hey, can you give me, like, can you, uh, they're not going to give you like this cream of the cream technical terrible questions that are down the road. They're going to ask you like, hey, have you ever, like, how do you run an A/B test? And if you can't answer that one, then you're never going to get to the the crazy stuff. So my recommendation once again is learn to program, and then after that, make sure that you have your bases covered for those first couple ones, uh, that first like couple layers of uh, knowledge around uh, experimentation and hypothesis testing. Okay, looks like we're out of questions. So let's have another round of applause. I want to thank everyone for attending online and attending here. And I look forward to seeing the future presentation. Thank you so much.